All right, good morning, folks. It's 9 a.m. Uh, there's still quite a few people that haven't shown up yet, so we'll kind of take our time getting started here. Today, we're going to go over the bandsaw. Um, the bandsaw is not a real complex animal, um, but it is one of the more interesting machines in the shop. Um, a lot of people believe the bandsaw to be one of the easiest, safest machines to learn how to use, uh, when in reality, uh, it, it probably causes more minor injuries than any other machine in the shop. Um, and the reason is that people often think that it's a simple piece of cake, easy, no problems machine to use. Um, there are ways to avoid having anything happen to you. And we'll go over those today. So the way a bandsaw works, and, and pardon me if I have to stop for a moment and let somebody else in. The way a bandsaw works is it uses a blade, a continuous blade, like this, okay? It's just a loop, big continuous blade, okay? And the length of this blade or the size of this blade is determined by the size of the machine or in reality, the diameter of the upper and lower wheels and then the distance between those two wheels. This happens to be a 94 and a half inch blade, but what this bandsaw is actually called is a 14 inch bandsaw, okay? Because of the diameter of the wheels. So a um, couple things about the bandsaw. Basically, it runs in this direction. So in other words, the blade is, all, the blade is always moving down into the table. Excuse me, I got somebody coming in. And with the blade moving down into the table, the teeth on the blade are pointed down, which means that as the blade is cutting through the material, it tends to hold your material to the table. If the teeth were pointed up and the blade was moving in an upward position, it would pick your material up off the table. So that's one of the nice things. That's one of the reasons you can freehand cut on the bandsaw. It's basically intended to cut curves and shapes uh, freehand. So um, some of the things that limit or control what the bandsaw is capable of, first of all, is the width of the blade. This is a pretty skinny blade. This blade itself, I believe, is an eighth inch or three sixteenths. It's an eighth inch blade. So the smaller the blade, in other words, the skinnier the blade, the tighter the turns you can make in your material, as opposed to a blade like this, which is, I believe this is a half inch blade. Half inch blade, okay? It's folded up right now, but you can see the difference in the width of the blades. You cannot make very tight turns with a wider blade, okay? So the smaller the blade, the skinnier the blade, the more detailed, tighter turns you can make, okay? Um, it runs at a constant speed. So the only thing you have control over is the rate at which you feed your material into it. Since this is a big, long blade, it's really flexible, especially these skinny blades. They are incredibly flexible. So the more pressure you put on the material, in other words, the harder you push the material into the blade, the more the blade is going to flex. Bandsaws have a tendency, especially these skinny blades, to do something called deflect. In other words, as you push into the blade, as you force your material into the blade, feed it into the blade, bandsaw blade will deflect. It will bend to the left and to the right. It will bend back. It will move around. So it's incredibly difficult to make a straight cut on a bandsaw. Bandsaws are not intended to make nice straight cuts. They just can't do it. It also makes it very difficult to follow a curve or a shape. So if I take a piece of material, and I draw, I'll try to do this so you can see it. shape on this like this okay now just as on the miter saw i put an x on the scrap side the piece i'm not going to keep this would be the piece i'm going to save this would be the piece that didn't put in the trash so i know which side to put the blade on now on the bandsaw what you cannot do let me zoom this in a little bit maybe you can see a little better come on There we go. Okay, on the bandsaw, what you can't do, okay, 
is you can't put the blade right on the line and follow that line exactly. It's not going to happen. You're never going to be able to follow that line perfectly. That's number one. Number two, on the bandsaw blade, the teeth on the bandsaw blade, every other tooth is offset. In other words, one point to the left, the next one points to the right, the next one points to the left, the next one points to the right. So it leaves a really rough surface when it cuts. So the goal here in using the bandsaw is to cut just outside the line. In other words, do something we call save the line. All right, we want to cut just outside this line. That gives us the opportunity to do two things. Number one, clean up all the bandsaw blade marks, the rough surface that's left by the blade. And secondly, to sand it down to our line, okay? Like I said, we, there's no way we're gonna cut dead on this line. It's not gonna happen. I don't care how good you think you are, okay? Now, we don't wanna cut way out here, right? And leave this much material to have to sand off. We wanna get close to the line without allowing the blade to touch the line, okay? Now, the way this bandsaw controls some of the blade deflection is with this little setup right here. This is called the foot of the bandsaw. There's another one just like it, just below the table down here. Okay, you can see it if you look down into it. This is the throat, it's called the throat plate. It's real similar to the table saw and the dado saw in terminology. So this foot consists of three basic items. First of all, there's two little blocks right here on either side. These little thumb screws allow you to move these blocks out and back in, okay? They should touch the sides of the blade directly behind the teeth. You don't want them touching the teeth. Hold on, I got somebody coming in. Lindsay. You don't want these blocks physically touching the teeth. You want them set just behind the teeth on the body of the blade itself, okay? Those control help to control twisting of the blade as you're cutting. It doesn't stop it, helps to control it, okay? There's another part directly behind this, and that's this little bearing right here. This bearing is supposed to rest, and this one's not, I'll have to fix that. It's supposed to rest just behind the blade, not touching the blade when it's not running, just a hair like a dollar bill thickness behind the blade, so that when you start to feed your material into it and the blade is pushed back, the back of the blade supported by this bearing as this bearing spins okay this is called the thrust bearing all right so that helps to control twisting of the blade and bending of the blade this way away from your cut there's another one just below the surface now this only works if you keep the foot of your material about a quarter of an inch Above the surface of the wood. The way we do that is there's a knob on the back of the machine here. I know you can't see it, but up this black shaft right here, there's a knob on the back that when you break it loose, it allows you to slide this down. Basically, the way we set it up in here, take the tip of your finger, set it under the foot, slide it down until it contacts the board, tighten it down. We want to keep the foot of the bandsaw about a quarter of an inch above the material. That helps control twist and deflection of the blade. It doesn't stop it, it just helps control it or diminish it. If you have it all the way up here, I'll show you what happens. So what's gonna happen if we have it all the way up here and we start to make a cut? Okay, so we're embedded in the board right now. What's going to happen is, look how much that thing can twist. Okay, it, it can almost twist. Well, it can twist 90 degrees around. But when we bring that foot down to where it's supposed to be, it controls that twist a lot more. We can't turn this nearly as much. We can't twist that blade nearly as much. So that's what helps control deflection, keeping this foot down close to the material. Okay, so when we go to make a cut, and I'm going to raise this, I know I'm not supposed to, like I just said, but I'm going to raise this foot up a little bit so you guys can see this. You won't be able to see it with the foot down all the way. So when I start to make a cut, there's a couple things I want to make sure and do. Number one, never under any circumstances put your fingers or any part of your hand in the path of the blade. Keep it to either side of the blade or you can support it on both sides. 
okay? So we never want to have our hand in the path of the blade. The reason for that is, it takes a little bit of pressure to feed your material through this blade. Not a lot, a little bit. And depending on how sharp the blade is, if it's dull, it may take a little more pressure. But if you take a look at this piece of material right here, there's a knot in it, okay? Now, 99% of the time, you can see these knots, but sometimes you may not see a knot. It's on the back side or it's embedded in the center of a board, especially on thicker boards. You may not see it. You may not see soft spots and more dense spots in the material. So as you're cutting, you're cutting along, you're cutting along, it's cutting just fine, okay? It's cutting nice and easy, it doesn't take much pressure to get it in there. All of a sudden, you hit a more dense area of the material and you have to start pushing harder. And it takes more pressure to feed the board in. If, you have to, if that happens towards the edge of the board and you have your thumb right here, and all of a sudden, you're adding a little more pressure to get through that dense spot, that knot, and all of a sudden, the wood softens up again right at the end, it's going to speed up and bam, your thumb goes right into the blade. Okay? So we want to make sure that our hands are on either side of the board or a single hand here, or you can pull from the back side as well. Okay, you can pull from you can pull from back here as well, as opposed to having your hand in front of the blade. Now, a couple of the tricks to using a bandsaw, they're not as easy as a lot of people think to use. It takes practice. Okay, a couple of the tricks you can use, and let's take a look at it with this board that I marked. So I'm gonna save the line when I make this cut. In other words, I'm going to cut just outside this line, trying to keep the blade close to my black mark, but not touching it, all right? So I'm gonna make this cut. You can see how close, hopefully you can see how close I have the blade to my line. Now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna to start to spray away from my line or towards my line. All I have to do is back up a little bit and come back at it in a better direction. So if I start making this cut, and I'll try to see if you guys can see this. Now, I've got to make a pretty hard turn right here. I've got to make the turn right here. It's, it's a little tighter turn right here, okay? So I've really got to rotate my board. I've got to rotate my board quite a bit. Okay? I'm not pushing it. I'm rotating it. Now I've gotten back online. I continue my cut. As I come to this next turn, I'm going to rotate the board again. make that turn and I'm going to pull it through. So what I have, if you able to see that I did not cut to the line, I just left the line. I just did what's called the stage the line. I never let the blade touch the line, but I got close enough to it where it's not going to take a lot of effort and time for the sander and clean that up, clean up all the blade marks. I'm sure you guys can't quite see it, but the surface here is really rough where I made the cut. Okay, so I'll do two things. I'll get rid of all these rough surfaces left of the blade, and I'll sand down to the line. Using a bandsaw is not an exact science. Um, like I said, you're not going to be able to cut exactly to the line, and it's not going to cut seriously accurate lines. I mean, this is not something you can do, okay, let's say you wanted to mount this board to another board, you're not going to be able to do this on the bandsaw if you're going to cut it to a this right. Okay, this is usually a decorative, um, a decorative thing, um, cutting out shapes, letters, stuff like that. We cannot make inside cuts on the bandsaw. In other words, we can't make a cut like that on the inside of the board without having an entry point. Somewhere we have to enter this board to make this cut and cut that out. Gap left here. There is a tool that we have, uh, we don't really have it here. Um, you can use a scroll saw to do this where you drill a hole and the blade is just a single piece about this long. You drill a hole, you feed the blade up into it, and then you box the top of the blade in, the bottom of the blade in, and then you get it cut. And you see, we really don't use this, so we don't, I, I think we've got it stored out in the shed outside. We just don't use it. We have other ways of Anything 
what I've missed on this guy. Safety is basically to keep your hands and fingers away from the blade and out of the path of the blade. So it's like a little tip. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. So when you're cutting on the bandsaw, you're going to end up having a lot of little pieces come off, off the time. As you cut, you'll have little pieces like that. You guys see that little piece stuck in there? Your first thought is usually, oftentimes, to just take your finger and flick that piece out of the way. Okay? Really, really bad idea. Oftentimes, what you'll end up doing is flicking that piece out of the way, and as you do, you'll flick your fingernail or the back of your finger into the front of that blade, cut your fingernail off. Really bad idea. We have a rule in this shop that applies to every shop and that rule is you cannot remove scrap material from near a blade while the machine is still running. In other words, if you want to clear this scrap material out of the way, you keep cutting. You have to stop the machine, wait until the machine stops, and then clean the blade. Okay? So the same thing goes for the table saw, the dado saw, the miter saw, the band saw, the router table, any machine in here that wants to clean this type of way. Um, you want to make sure a couple other little oddball things about the band saw. Number one, the way they make these blades, I don't know, maybe you can see it on the machine. The way these blades are made, this blade material comes on a big bowl, a big foil. Okay? I mean, it works. There's somebody else trying to get in here. So this, this blade material comes on a big spool, okay? Nice long piece. What they do is just they cut the length off this spool if you want, and they tack well the two ends together. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but you should be able to see the little weld right here, okay? This is where it's been tacked at the ends to the proper length and then ground down smooth. So what happens a lot of times, that ends up being one of the weak points, depending on the manufacturer, ends up being one of the weak points of the blade. So what can happen is these blades can crack, right? They won't break all the way, they'll crack. When you turn the machine on, you'll hear this inconsistent tick, 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 tick sound. When you turn one of these on and you hear that sound, that tells you that this blade is cracked. What you need to do is just turn it off, come get me, or replace the blade. Going to break. Now, if it does break for whatever reason, um, it's not a seriously dangerous issue. There's a guard right here that's going to keep the broken blade from flapping around and hitting you. Basically, all that happens is the bottom portion down here is the drive wheel, which is what the motor is connected to. The upper wheel down here is the tensioning wheel. In other words, you can raise and lower this to change the blade and tension the blade. You can also tilt it to keep it centered on the wheel. Okay, um, so I forgot where I was going with that, but anyway. Anyway, if you hear that tick, tick sound stop, it's not going to do anything. The blades are going to keep moving as it's been broken. It's just going to sit there and flap around. It's not going to move much because it's a guard right there. So another thing there, we never remove guards. Uh, if you run the machine, the guards can always be replaced. With them. One little thing of note I just thought of, if you ever step up to a machine and it's unplugged, Okay, for whatever reason, don't ever plug a machine in and start using it. Okay, it's been unplugged for a reason. It's supposed to be tagged if there's a problem with it. Unplug and tag and set up so that you can't plug it in, but that doesn't always happen. So anytime you see a machine in the shop that is unplugged, please do not just plug it in and start using it. There could be a problem with it. Okay, it needs to be addressed. I don't always have time during the class address something or fix something um, right at that point in time. Sometimes you have to wait for the end of the day. All right. So that's the basics of the bandsaw. There's not a whole lot more to it. But let me show you one more thing over here. And I told you guys that we don't cut on the line. We practice what's called save the line. The bandsaw blade runs just outside this line. Okay. 
once you've got this done, we go to the spindle center. Let's see if I can wheel us over there to the spindle center. I've got a cord on here that should be long enough. Let's see if it is. Now, it's not just the spindle sander. There's other sanders we can use to clean things up depending on whether it's curves or more flat surfaces or things like that. But let's take a look and see if you guys can see this. Now, I know it's going to be really difficult to see, but let's get you here. So this is our spindle sander, okay? It's actually called an oscillating spindle sander. Let me see how close we can get on this. A little closer. It's very dusty. Okay. So this is called an oscillating spindle sander. This is one of our um, floor standing sanding machines we have in the shop. Okay. Um, these spindles themselves can be changed. It's basically a rubber mandrel, this black guy right in here with a sanding sleeve slid onto it. And then there's a bolt on top that holds it in, onto this shaft, okay? The reason it's called an oscillating spindle sander is, well, very simply, it oscillates as it's rotating. And what that accomplishes is, it makes sure that your sanding marks are gonna be left from this, this sander are not in line on here. It's gonna reduce the visibility of the sanding marks. But more importantly, it keeps this thing from heating up um, and wearing out a very specific portion of this. You can see up here this brown portion at the top of the spindle. Basically, that's been used quite a bit. It needs to be cleaned, but instead of cleaning it, what I did was I just flipped the spindle in for end so it clean parts down here. When you use the spindle sander, you have to keep your material flat on the table. You can't hold it up in the air, you can't angle it, anything like that. You have to hold it flat to the table and you have to hold on to it. Now this thing is rotating in a counterclockwise direction right now, okay? It's going this way, all right? I always wanna move my material against the rotation of a cutter or a sander. So I wanna move it from right to left. It's kind of the same as the router tables in here. We always move our material from the right to the left on this machine, the router tables and things like that. The way you do this is basically just put it up against it, Keep your material moving at all times. Don't just hold it in one place and sand it, but keep it moving at all times. It's gonna remove material pretty quickly, especially on pine like this. This is a soft material. And it doesn't take a lot of pressure. The more pressure you put on it, obviously the more material is gonna be removed. So if you're getting close to your line, you're doing fine tuning down to your line, okay? You wanna put lighter pressure on it. You guys can see the material kind of building up here. Okay, so this allows us to get right to our line. Stand to our line. So what we've done, what we've been able to do, get it so you can see it there. These little fuzzies are always left over. You can see that I've kind of sanded to my line. I've gotten down to the line. It's a much smoother curve and I've gotten rid of the bandsaw marks. Okay. So that is our spindle sander. Okay. So there's other sanders in here. Um, for example, there's this guy. This is our edge sander. Let's see if I can get this card over here without killing everything. Our edge sander is, um, we use it a lot in the guitar class for um, initial shaping and cleaning up of a body blank. Okay, so this is our edge sander, and it's also an oscillating edge sander. So you'll notice that as it moves, it's rocking back and forth. This removes a lot of material very, very quickly. We cannot sand small pieces on this, okay? You do not want your hands in this area, you want your hands back here. There's also about a four inch diameter shaft down here that you can do larger diameters at this end. That's why this table's right here, okay? But one of the things about sanders, and not just, um, here, let me get something real quick. Not just machines that sand, but any sanding at all, whether it's a spindle sander, an edge sander like this, a 
palm sander, like a random orbit sander, something you do manually, okay? Anytime you have a sander, even hand sandpaper, all right? Um, geez, that thing is really messed up. Anytime you have, oh, let's just put this, anytime you're doing any kind of sander, okay? The process of sanding is not meant to create flat, straight surfaces. So you can't take a board that um, you had at the table saw and you ripped to width. And let's say you ripped this board to width. And when it was done, it was supposed to be four inches wide. Let's say you just missed it a little bit and you didn't set the fence right. And it's about an eighth of an inch too wide. Okay, so in other words, you've got a board that's four and one eighth inches wide instead of four inches wide, like it's supposed to be. That's not but something that you sand down to four inches wide. In other words, you wouldn't bring it over here to this edge sander and take an eighth of an inch off the edge to get it down to four inches wide. You go back to the table saw, reset the fence at the proper width, and cut it down the final side. Let's say you go to the miter saw and you cut, you forget to use a stop and you cut two boards. They're both supposed to be 12 inches long, but one of them ended up being about 12 and a quarter inches long, a little too long. I've seen students come over here to the edge sander or the spindle sander and try to sand that extra quarter inch off to make those two boards match in length. It doesn't work that way. Sanders can't make straight, square edges at the end. They are never intended to do that. Sanders are only intended to clean up shapes, um, things like that. So you can never use an edge sander, a spindle sander, even hand sandpaper to make two edges meet nicely. It doesn't work that way. We use other machines for that. Um, sanding is just to clean up things and yeah, just to get it ready for finish. That's what sanding is for. Okay, so machines, these sanding machines are not made for that. Now, to get you guys ready for the miter saw quiz, there are five questions on the miter saw quiz. And the questions that are on the miter saw quiz are as follows. And I've got a little, a little thing here to maybe help. Okay, a couple little uh, I don't know, samples. Like that. Okay, so the first question in the Microsoft quiz is this. True or false? The table saw is the best choice when cutting to length. Answer to that is false. Okay. Got a board here and saw blade. Okay. So hopefully you guys can read this. Okay. Those arrows indicate the cut line of a blade. Okay, so if my blade's running along this way, right, cut like this. That is a rip cut. Okay, that's done on the table saw using the rip fence. In other words, what we're doing is we're altering the overall width of a board. So if I take a tape measure, and right now this board is just a hair over six inches wide. I go to the table saw and I make a rip cut using the rip fence, and I can end up with two boards that are two inches wide or one board that's four inches wide. Okay, we're talking width here. A rip cut alters the width of a board. This is the direction the blade's going. Okay, so the table saw is not where we cut to length. Okay, when we cut to length, it's called a cross cut. All right, we're cutting across this way. That's done on the miter saw. That alters the overall length of the board. So if I have a board like this, it happens to be seventeen and a half inches long. All right, I can get a board out of here that's eight inches long, or ten inches long, or fourteen inches long, or sixteen inches long. That's a cross cut. When you see the word cross cut on any test or anything in here, it is done on the miter saw. We cut in this direction. Okay. That's a cross cut, all right? So this is cutting to length. This is cutting to width. The question again says, true or false? The table saw is the best choice when cutting to length? False, that's the miter saw, okay? Obviously it's a miter saw quiz, so hopefully that'll help. The second question, a board must be at least how long to safely cut it to length on the miter saw? So here's your answer. The minimum length allowed on the miter saw
That is a stick. Gee, that's a terrible stick. It's six inches, okay? Six inches is about the length of a dollar bill, okay? Just for, for a little frame of reference there, okay? So, or a hundred dollar bill. I wouldn't really know that for sure. I don't think I've seen a hundred dollar bill in years. So, six inches is the minimum length on the miter saw. It's the shortest length at which you can safely place your hand on the board and hold it tight to the fence and to the table and still make a cut. Okay, remember this is a cross cut. You're going to be cutting this way, not this way. This is a rip, this is a cross cut. Okay, so six inch minimum length on the miter saw. I have a here. Okay, good. Um, always use a stop block when cross cutting more than one board for the same length on the miter saw. There's that word cross cut. If you see the word cross cut, we're talking about the miter saw. So if I want two boards that are the exact same length, okay, two or more boards, I have to use a stop. I can't manually just make a line, cut it, make a line, cut it, make a line, cut it. I won't end up with consistent boards, okay? So we have to use a stop when cross cutting on the miter saw. Next one, the edge of your board must be tight against the blank on either side of the blade when performing cross-cutting operations on a miter saw. The edge of your board needs to be tight against the fence, okay? A lot of these machines in here have fences. It needs to be tight against the fence on either side of the blade or you're getting into a situation where you can cause a kickback, okay? So the edge of your board must be tight against the fence on either side of the blade when cross-cutting on the miter saw. Last question, how many cuts does it take to accurately cut a board to length on the miter saw? The answer is two. Your first cut that you make on any board is a trimming and squaring cut. You need to square one end so that you can now measure from that end, make a mark out here, and cut the opposite end. Both ends have to be cut on a board, okay? First cut, the trimming and squaring cut. Second cut, cuts the board to the final length, okay? So that's the five questions on the quiz. I'm gonna show you guys something here. I'll do the old share the screen thing. My mouse is caught. All right. So here's what you'll do. I'm going to go ahead and open the quiz. Okay. So when you go to the miter saw quiz here, let's let's go back. I'm going to go back to the beginning. When you open Canvas and you come to this class, Manufacturing One, all right, you're at your home page. All you have to do is go down here to Modules, scroll down, here's the week we're in right now, week six, January 4th through 8th. Go to the miter saw quiz, and for some reason, let me see here, for some reason, I don't have student view available over here anymore. I don't know why, but I wish I could show it in student view. All you're gonna do is click on the miter saw quiz, Okay, um, so here are the instructions for it. Today's quiz covers the safe, op op safe operation of the miter saw. Below, you will find a link to a copy of the Woodshop Safety Test Answer Sheet. That's this blue link right here, okay? This link will take you to a copy of the safety test with all the correct answers included. If you find yourself having difficulty with any of the answers on the quiz, simply click on the link to find the question on the safety test that you're having trouble with. The correct answer will be found there. All of the questions on the quiz are taken directly from the safety test. Nothing has been changed. So when you have a problem on one of the questions, all you have to do is click on this link. It's going to take you to the safety test. For example, if you find the first question on here is true or false, the table saw is the best choice when cutting to length. Here's the question right here. True or false, the table saw is the best choice when cutting to length. That is false. The next question, the board must be at least how long to safely cut the length on the miter saw? Here's the question. A board must be at least six inches long to safely cut the length on the miter saw. The next question is always use a stop block when cross-cutting more than one board the same length on B. And they're worded exactly the same. Here it is. Always use a stop block when cross-cutting more than one board to the same length on B. And there's choices in there, just like there are here. Miter saw, okay? The next one, the edge of the board must be tied against the blank. Let's find it. Where the heck is it? The 
edge of your board must be tied against the, what the heck? I don't see it. Well, that'd be weird. Let's try down here. Here it is. The edge of your board must be tied against the fence on either side of the blade when performing cross cutting operations on a miter saw. The last one, how many cuts does it take to accurately cut a board to length on a miter saw? It's number 45 here. How many cuts does it take to accurately cut a board to length on a miter saw? It's two, okay? So every question and every answer is on that test that's linked right here, okay? So that quiz is now open and available to be taken. Um, you guys can go ahead and take it. Once you're done, you're welcome to take off. Thanks for being here. We'll see you guys again tomorrow. I will keep this open until the end of class. There's not that much time. There's about eight minutes, but it should be plenty of time to take this. Okay, so I will be here until 945, but you're welcome to go ahead and, and log out when you're done with the quiz or log out and take the quiz. All right? All right, you guys take care and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, folks. Thank mm -hmm. you.